गते आता ओम गते गते पर गते पर संगते बोधि सोह ते आता ओम गते गते पर गते पर संगते बोधि सोह ते आता ओम गते गते पर गते पर संगते बोधि सोह ते आता ओम गते गते पर गते पर संगते बोधि सोह ते आता ओम गते गते पर गते पर संगते बोधि सोह ते आता ओम गते गते पर गते पर संगते बोधि सोह ते आता ओम गते गते पर गते पर संगते बोधि सोह ते आता ओम गते गते पर गते पर संगते बोधि सोह ते आता ओम गते गते पर गते पर संगते बोधि सोह ते आता ओम गते गते पर गते पर संगते बोधि सोह ते आता ओम गते गते पर गते पर संगते बोधि सो So the enumerations part, yeah. So we have briefly gone over. <laughs> In fact, um, at some point, you know, we should have a more focused look at these enumerations. Uh, sometimes I think uh, people kind of jump into a topic like the Heart Sutra, like we have just jumped into it, you know, and we're too quick to just go the no, 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 yeah. and and kind of, in a way, you know, uh, deprive ourselves of the power of being able to see uh, how uh, the composite nature of experiences, the composite nature of our confusion, the composite nature of our suffering, the composite nature of our happiness, at the composite nature of everything. So these enumerations were given by the Buddha to help us see more clearly about this composite nature. So too quickly we go, no, 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 no. Then, uh, especially, you know, this is especially true for us who come from basically a material, materialist-based uh, kind of intellectual and cultural background. Mm -hmm. To say it's a materialist is not the same as materialistic. Materialistic is the culture of consumption. <laughs> We're not talking about material-based views of reality. If we have a material-based view of reality and then we uh, uh, kind of become excited by all this no, 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 often what we end up with is a nihilist view because we are parked in a materialist view and when we start no, 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 knowing away everything, we are left 
in a nihilist uh, place. When things are going well, and you are in that nihilist place, then you have a semblance of being very sophisticated. <laughs> when things are not going well, and you're left in that nihilist place, it's a very depressing, very dark place. You have no place to go. You don't even see the point of going to Dharma practice. This is the dangers, you know. Like people don't tend to talk about the dangers. Oh, Hot Sutra is so good, emptiness is so good, you know. But we have to be careful, you know, because of our baggage. Right? So I've seen how people who take to this material on emptiness, teachings on emptiness. But fundamentally, the basic position is materialist, right? So eventually, karma is considered secondary, teachings on karma. Considered like ah, it's just part and parcel of Buddhist context. Siddhartha was just part of a product of his time. And then we say he's awake. What does that mean? <laughs> he's only awake in the following ways. In other ways, ah, he's just part of. And then we think that, you know, if you understand emptiness, then you will know that karma is. Secondary. That's wrong view. Causality, karmic causality, is the way in which uh, the reality of emptiness plays out. Now it's just words hard to understand, but I'm planting a seed. Maybe later we have an opportunity to go into that and say, how is that so? But there are statements like this. So Nagarjuna, one of these great elucidators of the teachings on emptiness, he says that mm, another word for emptiness is dependent arising. That's so important to remember. Another word for this teaching on emptiness, shunyata, is dependent arising. And now, he doesn't say this explicitly, but what is dependent arising? Dependent arising is the principle of karmic causality. Everything appears, abides, and disappears through causes and conditions coming together, staying together, disintegrating. In its, in its disintegration, it gives rise to further arising, abiding, and disintegration. And all of that is possible. Why? Because think, things lack, phenomena lack, people lack, conditions lack inherent nature. Now, we go back to the no. So now we have some basic hopefully appreciation of the Buddha's, you know, uh, teaching and method of using the enumerations to see more clearly. Now let's start the next part, the no part. So what kind of no is this? We start on page five. Form is empty. Emptiness also is form. 
Emptiness is no other than form. Form is no other than emptiness. So the commentaries, the eight Indian commentaries, seven of them have something to say about that. Interestingly, one commentary completely doesn't bother to explain this. And you would think you're like, what? Isn't that like the most important, you know, quote from the Heart Sutra? Yes, in some ways it is. But one commentary just skips over this. <laughs> but nonetheless, we're going to look at it closer. Because this will help us understand the main kind of the main teaching in the perfection of wisdom, which is this teaching on shunyata. Now, shunyata is emptiness. Shunya is empty. So here, form is empty. Empty of what? Right before this line, we are told, empty of intrinsic nature. So form is not empty of what? First of all, to clarify, form is not empty of form. Yeah, form is not empty of form. Just to state the obvious. Yeah, but this obvious statement needs to be made. Yeah, because sometimes yeah, we might think the Heart Sutra is saying form is not real. That is what form empty of form means. Right? Form is not real. The Heart Sutra is not saying form is not real. The Heart Sutra doesn't have a problem with form. Doesn't have a quarrel with feeling. Doesn't have a quarrel with perception, mental formations, and consciousness. The Heart Sutra has a problem, so to say, with us identifying any of these five skandhas as having inherent nature. What, does, what is the implication of having inherent nature, uh, intrinsic nature? So that we need to understand. To have intrinsic nature is therefore to have the power to stand on its own. A self-existing, or sometimes the vocabulary is existing from its own side. It's able to exist in and of itself. But nothing exists in and of itself. Everything exists. Everything that exists, exists interdependently. Everything that exists, exists based on causes and conditions. And so now we, we, we can see better why Nagarjuna says the other word for emptiness is dependent arising. Things appear, things arise dependently, interdependently. So causes and conditions come together. So form is empty, form lacks uh, intrinsic nature. This lack of intrinsic nature is what our minds have to apprehend, our hearts have to see. have to realize, have to understand, have to apprehend, have to realize. The unfindability, sometimes it's also expressed like that. The unfindability of a self in form. 
So if we apply this formula to the question of self, of I, then it's saying your form is not you. But most of us, you know, I think intellectually, I think most of us would have no problem with the statement, your form is not you, right? I think intellectually, we all get this. So that's not where the problem is. Where the problem is, is that with regards to form, on a different level, we do think the form is me. We all have a mental image, which is often an appearance. That at the back of our minds, we hold on to as me. It could be the 39-year-old you, or the 29, or the 9, or the 59, or the 69. But something happened so that that, that memory of that image is, is part of your self-making, uh, your self-making process. So we do have on that level an image a physical, a visual image of you that you think of, you know, as me. So even that kind of subtle mistake, subtle idea of me, we want to free ourselves from. Another, uh, I think, place where we identify with our form, with our body as me, is when the body gives us problems. Then it's hard to not have our sense of self so tethered to body. But here's when we need to habituate, need to not forget. You know? The experience is the guest, it's not the host. Pain is the guest, not the host. Pleasure is the guest, not the host. And so if you want to kind of like use sentences, right? It's a shift from thinking, I am in pain, to I'm experiencing pain. I am angry, and I'm experiencing anger. That's the Hinayana step. Rather than I am angry, I'm experiencing anger, right? The next step to that is to question, who is this I? <laughs> oh, this I is actually the five skandhas bundled together. And even that is a particular moment of the five skandhas because the five skandhas are bundled together differently from moment to moment, right? It's completely dynamic. Right? So a particular moment of the five skandhas bundled in a particular way, yeah, can we see the momentary nature of that? So the more profound, more subtle is the Mahayana view of even these bundles of the five skandhas don't stand alone. Even those conditions are conditional. And so form is empty 
of intrinsic nature. The second part, right, emptiness also is form, presents a little bit of a problem for the commentaries, for the commentators. Yeah. Form is empty, at least in the realm of, you know, talking about it. Not so much a problem. Yeah. But emptiness is form. Hmm. You're saying that emptiness is form? So don't separate these two parts of the statement. You only run into a problem, a logical problem, when you separate the two. As if eh, they can exist eh, poles apart. One over here, one over here. But when you understand that emptiness also is form, is to address possibilities of nihilism arising from reading the first part, form is empty, or sometimes translated as form is emptiness. In case you slip into this idea of nothingness, the second part is to remind you and as for this emptiness that we are talking about here, as for this emptiness that Buddha is pointing us to look at, that emptiness is not some kind of metaphysical emptiness, not some kind of magical state, and not even a state of absence. But this emptiness is only has meaning and significance in the context of this particular form that you're experiencing now. Does that make sense? No? Form. This gong striker is empty of intrinsic nature. At least intellectually, you got that, right? And it is only in relation to this that we are even talking about this emptiness. Emptiness is always emptiness of something, in relation to something in relation to the striker, in relation to this uh, pencil bag, I, I suppose, in relation to this book, in relation to this iPad. There's no other emptiness to be realized independent of these various forms. And so this is to prevent us from slipping into some kind of mystical emptiness floating around out there. Uh, or lurking inside even, wherever. Mm -hmm. The emptiness of this uh, microphone here cannot be understood and has no purpose or no function apart from this microphone that exists here. So this is why form is empty, emptiness also is form. And part of that implication then is no need to get rid of form, healing, perception, mental formation, and consciousness. <clears throat> In fact, not just no need, there is no meaning to talking about emptiness. <laughs> if there wasn't these dependently arising phenomena,
in, in the commentaries, they, they also talk about how it's not, yeah, it's not a simplistic equation, you know, form is emptiness. In, in, in the commentaries, they say, the defining characteristic of form is the quality of being destructible. It can be destroyed. This is like, you know, in, in, in Buddhist philosophy, now this is, you know, a more developed, right? Later, teasing out right, the implications of what the Buddha said. Then the definition of form, right, one of the qualities for something to be called a type of form is that it has the quality of being destructible, can be destroyed. And if that is the characteristic of form, which is the characteristic or the quality of, it is destructible, right? It can be broken then it cannot be literally that form is emptiness. Because the characteristic of emptiness is, is what? It cannot be destroyed. Emptiness by definition is not something that can be destroyed. <laughs> so that's why Vajra and Vajrayana, the ritual implement, is a symbol for emptiness. It's indestructible. So it's not, uh, the commentaries point out, uh, the Buddha is not saying, no, literally form and emptiness are the same thing. But rather what the Buddha is, form is emptiness of intrinsic nature. So it's a very specific kind of emptiness that we're talking about here. In fact, elsewhere, there is like a, a enumeration of the 16 types of emptiness. <laughs> yeah. And each way of thinking about emptiness in these 16 ways, they are like, variations, uh, all 16 fingers pointing to the moon. And when you use those 16 fingers, you know, it brings you, it brings the moon more and more into focus so that you can see more clearly. But sometimes, you know, all you need is one finger and you can see the moon. So then you don't need the other 15, you know. In the same way, feeling perception, formation, and consciousness are also empty of intrinsic nature, inherent existence. They don't exist from their own side. They don't exist standing alone. So every time you hear things like that, you, you should say, what's the implication? What's the take-home lesson here? Right? The take-home lesson here is, you know, it's not as solid as you think it is. So you can reconfigure this situation. There's always room to make different choices. The happiness that has turned up, make a certain different set of choices, can quickly turn into suffering. The suffering that has turned up, make a different set of choices, you can turn it into happiness. Right, make lemons out of make make lemonade out of lemons.
Therefore, Shariputra, all dharmas are emptiness. All phenomena has this quality of that, of them, uh, each and every one of them being empty of intrinsic nature. Uh, they are without characteristics. Now, the reason it's said here is that they are without characteristics is because uh, at the level of enumerations, the characteristics of each of these things are clearly explained. The characteristic of form is it can be destroyed. The characteristic of space is it cannot be destroyed. No matter how much you put into space, right, to occupy the space, space is never destroyed. Understand that? Right? No matter how much you put in it, Space never destroyed. So that in the Mahamudra teaching says, you know, that is also the nature of your mind. No matter how much blah, blah, blah going on, it doesn't destroy that characteristic of space. So ordinarily, we say all dharmas, every dharma, every phenomena has its own characteristics that makes it what it is. So the, the, the characteristic of the fire dharma, the fire atom, is heat. What defines fire is heat. What defines water is fluidity. What defines wind is movement. But here it says they are without characteristics. So now, again, what we're doing is not so much like contradicting the basic position given in the enumerations, but rather helping us see that even though we say fire, right, the characteristic of fire is warmth, right? That warmth has no meaning if cold doesn't exist. And because of that, it's dependently arising. Hot and cold. Maybe, you know, hot and cold is not exactly the problem. In a way, the Buddha, you know, wasn't, not in a way, but absolutely, the Buddha was, wasn't the HVAC guy. So he didn't exist to solve our cold and hot problems. <laughs> but he did you know, exist or teach to solve our happiness and suffering problem. But using the example of hot and cold, he's trying to show us. Even as you do, you pursue happiness, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you know, <laughs> even as you go about doing that, don't lose sight of the fact that this happiness is a dependent arising. All dharmas are not born and not destroyed. Again, in the level of enumerations, we are taught to see how things come into existence, abide for a while, and are destroyed. Yeah? So the changing nature of everything that we experience. But here it's saying, actually they're not born or not destroyed. Why are they not born and not destroyed? Because 
to born, to be born, right? To come into existence would require some substantiality to it. But this substantiality is a construct. It's a construct. So this is where insights from current research in quantum physics become interesting. I actually hear this table, right? Literally, is empty in that, not, not empty of intrinsic nature, but empty on, on the quantum physics level. So that discovery can kind of enhance, right? Our understanding of, ah, right? But if you try to walk through walls, maybe not so easy. Oh, but it's empty. <laughs> Come on. Come on. <laughs> you hurt yourself and you ruin my wall. Neither of those are very ideal. Certainly there are accounts of <laughs> magical feats of walking through walls, you know. All I can say is possible. Probable? Maybe not so probable. But possible? Like there's nothing. Yeah, we don't need to even like I think we take this for granted, you know? Like we don't need to read fairy tales or myth or everything about the impossible becoming possible. Just look at modern technology. That's no better miracles to witness than modern technology. We have such an amazing uh, creation, this phone, that none of us really use it as a phone anymore. We do everything except for talking on it. You know? <laughs> In fact, if someone tries to talk to you on it, you're like, wait, did someone die? Why are they calling me? <laughs> we have transcended, you know, the phone. <laughs> In a neurotic way, we have transcended the phone, you know. <laughs> really, when somebody calls, you're like, wait, wait, what's going on? Wait, no. Yeah, accident, you know. <laughs> Not stained or unstained. Here is stained by suffering, confusion, poisons. Not decreasing, not increasing. And so these are the normal qualities that we associate with phenomena. And they have characteristics. Uh, then they uh, they appear, and then at some point they disappear. Uh, they are, uh, you know, they involve suffering. They don't involve suffering. Uh, they are increasing or they are decreasing. So here is pointing to a more subtle understanding. There's no coming or going. That's another pair that is used, no coming or going. So in, in other places, for example, Nagarjuna, in his um, famous writing uh, called Verses to the Middle, or Verses to the Center, uh, he takes up some of these questions about, for example, time. Okay. So another illustration of what, what is this emptiness that we're talking about? What is this dependent arising that we're talking about? You know, it's the example of time is, is, is really good. Okay. As in temporal time in terms of past, present, future. Okay. So now you will say, wait, quantum physics? And then the whole plethora of movies that recently came out, 
which until now I've attempted to watch it six times. I still have no idea what's going on. <laughs> that movie that won all these everything everywhere, whatever, you know. Yeah, everything everywhere all at once. That's how I feel about it. That even the title is all jumbled up, you know. I'm just not smart enough to to have the power to stay the whole time to watch from beginning to end. I always start and never finish. <laughs> Maybe I'm illustrating, you know, everything all together all the time. <laughs> Uh, my relationship to that movie is 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 like that. <laughs> but here, let's let's so without going into that, right? Let's go into the more kind of ordinary common sense. So we begin at the commonsensical. Present, past, future. So on the commonsensical level, no problem with it. The Buddha is not. Yeah, anti past, present, future. Yeah. The Dharma is not a you know weird cult yeah, that prohibits clocks and watches and calendars. But the Buddha does take us in this kind of mental exercise, yeah. this mental experiment to say. Uh, we can talk about past, present, and future, but we should not let that talk fool us into thinking that past, present, and future exist. Exist how? Exist independently. So, Be here now, right? That's a very trendy spiritual idea. Be here now, right? Even that, you know, can turn into the tyranny of now. If you don't understand that now is a construct based on later and before. Then you say, but now is real. How do you know? You have to summon two witnesses. All right? And who are the two witnesses? Later and before. And then you say, okay, now later and before, prove your credentials. How does before prove its credentials? He will say, I, I need to get now to, you know, vouch for me. But then the court will say, wait, now call you to vouch for him. <laughs> yeah, if you dramatize this, right? It can be a nice short movie, you know? <laughs> a YouTube clip of like, I don't know, three minutes is more than enough. It would seem like an eternity to prove this case, right? Imagine a case, you know? When now needs to prove hmm, to verify who he is, you know, oh, this would be a nightmare for recovering your password. Sometimes it feels like that, you know. In order to prove who you are, you have to summon something else, but that something else needs to prove that it is that something else which you have to prove, but then you're like, I can't prove that. That's the problem. So now meets before and later to vouch for it. But before and later needs to be vouched by now. That is what this emptiness is pointing to. what this emptiness is pointing to. Suffering, happiness, 
win, loss, gain. All of these conditions that we run away from, that we chase after, they all have this ephemeral nature. So when we see this, right, what happens? Not when we see this game over, you know, everything poof into non-existence. But when we see this, and the Buddha says, when we see this correctly, we become free. Free from what? Free from suffering. From the Bodhisattva standpoint, free from fear. Free from, free from fear so that you can do what? You can do the impossible task of liberating infinite sentient beings. By definition, infinite. So in one formulation of the relationship between the path, the result, and yeah, the function of the result, you can think of it that way, right? The path uh, is like the practices that you need to do to become Buddha. And then why do you want to become Buddha? You want to become Buddha so that you can function in a certain way that is beneficial to others, right? So the path, the result, and the function of the result. Right? One formulation of how to understand this. So this is where we now move into Vajrayana. Remember I said one of the characteristics of what qualifies as a Vajrayana level? Yeah. So remember, right? Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana in our context is not talking about three forms of Buddhism, three traditions or lineages. No, it's three levels of understanding within our own process. Hmm? So here, Vajrayana says, the result is the path. Right? That sounds kind of like, what does that mean? Taking the result as the path. I think some of you have come across this statement. What does that mean? So here, just to show you, my my why I have this position like it's not about this form of Buddhism or that form of Buddhism. So I'll give you one of my usual examples of how this principle, this Vajrayana principle, plays out in the context of 12th century Japan. And so this is the story of the founder of Soto Zen. Dogen. Dogen grew up in medieval Japan and at a young age became a monk when his parents died and he was under the care of his uncle. Uncle was a monk, so, you know, to live with uncle, he has to become a monk, you know, shave his head, young, young kid, you know. Then he grew up in that context and then it turns out that he had the karma to take this seriously. So he was practicing within a tradition called Tendai, Tendai Buddhism, on Mount Hiei. I don't know if he actually went to Mount Hiei. Maybe he did, but short, but he belonged to that tradition. The Tendai tradition, one of its fundamental kind of like uh, doctrinal position uh, is the idea of what is called Hongaku in Japanese. Uh, Hongaku means... Uh, uh, hon is fundamental, gaku is awakening. So it, in other words, it's what we would call Buddha nature. So in that tradition, they say that all beings are fundamentally Buddhas already. They have fundamental awakened state, uh, hongaku. So it is said that uh, Dogen, as, as he got that, then he was like, well, then what's the role of practice? <laughs> what's the relationship between shugyo, practice, and hongaku? 
And it says that 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 question, you know, building up, building up, building up, building up until you know, it led to a crisis. Right? That he thought only one can be true. Practice is necessary. Or fundamentally we are Buddhists is true. And if fundamentally we are Buddhists is true, then practice has no reason. It said that's 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 like what drove him to seek the answers. There was no answer. He traveled to China, which was very dangerous to cross the straits that sea. Many boats would sink, people would die. But he took on this journey and went to China because it is said that nobody in Japan could answer this question to his satisfaction. Finally, in China, it said that he met this teacher and he fully then, the teacher led him to an understanding of how, what is the exact relationship between practice and result. So Dogen then, his famous kind of uh, uh, answer to this question is, practice is the activity uh, of Buddhahood. Right? Rather than practice uh, is what leads to Buddhahood, Practice is the natural expression of the awakened state. So to sit in Zazen is to manifest awakening. To not be in the state of Zazen is to fall from your natural state. Furthermore, he says, since awakening is endless, right? We all agree on that. Therefore, therefore what? Practice is endless. Therefore, liberating sentient beings is endless. Therefore, bodhisattva vow is not so crazy. It's just the natural state of being Buddhist. Right now, cause and effect collapse in a, in a way, not collapses and disappearing in the negative sense, but now path and result are completely in the same moment. That's Vajrayana. <laughs> the path is the result. And since <laughs> the state of Buddha has no end to it, therefore practice also has no end to it. And if your practice has an end to it, then it's not the practice of Buddhas. And so in the Zen tradition, there's this story, one story. This is from uh, 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 in China. Uh, Ma Zhu, Ma, Ma Zhu Dao Yi, and his student, I, I believe. Either he was a student or the disciple. Um, anyway, I remember the name of one of the two master disciples. I think it's Ma Zhu and his disciple. Mm. Disciple was meditating, doing formal practice. Teacher comes along and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm meditating. Obviously, the student knows, wait, what kind of trick question is this, right? I'm meditating. And then the, 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 the teacher said, what for? See, the real question is this, what for? It's not, what are you doing, right? The real question is, what for? So this is goes back to my point about uh, 
what is the fundamental understanding of what is it for? Yeah. Just like scientists and, and quantum mm -hmm. physicists, right? They're not interested in dukkha. They're interested in something else. Right? So likewise, here teacher asks, what for? This is where the, you know you might get caught. So the student got caught. He says, what did he say? What do you think he said? So that I can become Buddha. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Eh. Why? Never mind. So the teacher said, oh, okay. Teacher goes away. In a little bit, he comes back, you know, rather annoyingly. <laughs> I'm trying to meditate to get enlightened. You keep interrupting. <laughs> so this time, how does the teacher interrupt? He's poking around, you know. So the student is like, what is he doing? And sees the teacher like poking around the ground in front, you know, the floor. And then eventually he sees him digging up a towel, a floor towel. And he succeeds in dislodging a floor towel. And then he takes a cloth and he starts polishing. Until finally the disciple couldn't take it anymore and say, Master, what are you doing? He said, I'm polishing a towel. <laughs> of course, then it requires what for? Right? He says, to make it a mirror. <laughs> okay, you have to remember, uh, now footnote, right? In those times, there's no mirror as we know it, right? Mirrors are made from polishing what? Metal, uh, bronzes, you know, yeah. So you have to polish, yes, to get the mirror. But you have to polish the right thing, right? So the students say, no amount of polishing that towel is going to make it into a mirror. Aha, teacher goes, no amount of meditating is going to make you a Buddha. If you don't understand that you are Buddha. So now you have to meditate differently. Not as, a, not as a means to an end, but as the expression of what you already are. So hence in Vajrayana, one of the methods we call deity yoga, it might seem so complicated, so difficult and all of that. But if we don't, if we get the fundamental principle there, it's saying, don't live your life as a postponement for some grand finale that's going to happen over there with fireworks and halos coming. Yes, there will be fireworks and halo. <laughs> but you cannot live your life, you cannot practice your dharma based on that expectation and waiting and postponing fireworks and halos over there, right now. Mm -hmm. Display your fireworks and your halo, now. So then the result is the path. Mm -hmm. And so here, the Vajrayana turns up in, if you read this, this Heart Sutra, right? Even though at the first read, you're like, Hard to understand, don't know what the heck is talking about. It's just playing with words, you know, all of that. Then you learn a little bit more. You go, oh, wow, wow, very profound, right? So you go on page eight. Therefore, Shariputra, since Bodhisattvas have no attainment, they rely on and abide in the perfection of wisdom. Since their minds are without obscuration, there is no fear. They pass completely beyond error and attain complete nirvana. You're like, mm -hmm, yes, yes. Now I understand. Good, good. All the Buddhas of the three times, by means of the perfection of wisdom, fully awakened to unsurpassed, complete, and perfect awakening. Oh, yes, yes. Right? And then? Therefore. The next word is therefore. 
Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom is the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the unequal mantra, the mantra that completely pacifies all sufferings. Since there is no deception, it should be known to be true. See, you are supposed to go, what? <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to go, okay? Therefore, what do you mean therefore? God, this is yeah, I thought we were done, right? You know, like you should just have stopped there. You know, the last sections, end of sutra. Can, we can go now. Please don't confuse me with this therefore, the mantra. Yeah. If 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 you were a professor and the the sutra was uh, something a student wrote you're like, right? At best you get a C plus. <laughs> but this is the greatest of the greatest classic, you know? Because now we have transitioned into the Vajrayana. Yeah? This very stark, you know, transition. Therefore, <laughs> and you're like, wait, can you please explain? <laughs> Even the commentaries don't explain. Therefore, <laughs> and, and those that do try to explain cannot really explain. What is this therefore? Therefore, gone, gone, gone beyond, completely gone beyond Bodhi. Now, I've said, right, one attempt in one of the commentaries is to link it to the whole process, the path. Gone is the path of accumulation. Gone, second gone, is the path of joining. Gone beyond is the path of seeing. Completely gone beyond the path of meditation. Bodhi, exclamation point, is the path of no more learning, right? In a way, you can say, if you want to take this literally, the grammar of the mantra doesn't allow that interpretation because it's not going. It's gone. It's done. It's finished. <laughs> If you want to take literally, although you know you can't take mantras too literally, they function on a different level. But just for the sake of that, to make a point, which is the Vajrayana point, don't think of it as something that will happen in the future. Right now, it's already gone. That means already arrived. This is really a notion of going. But it's saying, no, it's already gone. It's already arrived. A variation of this mantra would be arrived, arrived, completely arrived, arrived without any doubts. Yay! <laughs> free, free, free at last. So this is the mantra. What is mantra? The etymology given is that which protects the mind. Manastrata. That which protects the mind. Although Sanskritists will say this is a false etymology. Yeah, as in, that's not the real etymology. Yeah. But I call it the creative etymology. <laughs> Buddhist commentaries, you playing with words. And so, because that is the function of mantra, to protect the mind. To protect the mind from uh, dualistic proliferation. Uh, to stop 
this proliferation in its tracks. But not literally, okay? Don't, don't think of it as literally as in, you know, yelling you to shut up. Not, not stop in that way. But that thoughts can proliferate, but it doesn't leave traces. It doesn't entail suffering. Okay? Linking back up to how I say this samadhi is not the samadhi of throwing everything out. It's not like a cheap version of having a free, you know, sensory deprivation tank. Serenity now, cancel out all sound, sound, sight, smell, taste, touch. But rather this samadhi is the samadhi where you leave the sense doors all open and you're not affected by the comings and the goings. And not only that, on the Vajrayana level, we say, when you fully achieve this state, right, then all your thoughts, all the proliferation of thoughts turn into all-pervading wisdom and compassion. Every act that you do becomes of benefit to others. So it's called the all-beneficial. Kuntu Zambo. Samantabhadra, name of the primordial Buddha, is the all-beneficent, naturally, effortlessly beneficent, the all-good, Samantabhadra. Yes? Uh, back up one night. Uh -huh. Back up, mm -hmm. back up. I really don't understand this sentence on right. Therefore, share it with the sense of Buddhist thought must have no attainment. Uh huh. Yes. They rely only and abide in perfection of Buddhism. But I thought they had attainment. That's how they become a Buddhist thought. Yes. Uh, so, page eight at the top, the question is. How do we understand this line? Therefore, Shariputra, since bodhisattvas have no attainment, they rely on and abide in the perfection of wisdom. We said, wait, I thought bodhisattvas have attainment. You know, they attain Buddhahood, right? Actually, the Heart Sutra say no. Why? They are Buddhas. Yeah. In that sense, no attainment. Just like there's no form. It's not saying there's no form. <laughs> but it's saying, when the Bodhisattva finally gets it, that there's no Buddhahood to attain, that there's no sentient beings to save, that's when the, that's when the fireworks and the halos turn out. But you cannot start by saying, oh, there's nothing to do. No fireworks or halos. Unless you go on eBay and uh, order the parts. <laughs> yeah, if you link this back to the page before, it says, because it ends there, so it's playing with that. No, no, no suffering, no origin of suffering, no cessation of suffering, no path. That's the Four Noble Truths. Then, no wisdom. Of course, right? Bodhisattvas have wisdom. Otherwise, what are you talking about? Then it says no attainment. And then it also says and no non-attainment. It's pointing out all the dualistic And, and dualistic is not yet the problem because on the relative level, everything exists in that way. So also don't think that, you know, the Buddha is saying that dual, dualistic in the sense of subject and object itself is the problem. It's not understanding how object is object, how subject is subject and not understanding that what is object if you stand over there, turns into subject. What is subject when you stand over on the other side is object. Not recognizing that is the problem. So actually, we don't have a problem with duality either. 
The problem is the problem of knowing or not knowing. So we also don't, although it's become fashionable, non-dual, 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 you know? <laughs> oh, we are a non-dual tradition. People love talking about that, you know? A Zen master asked his student, do you understand emptiness? And so all these like Zen stories, they are stories, you know. Did they actually happen this way? Who knows? Doesn't matter. Let stories yeah, point to something, yeah, point to deeper truths, right? So anyway, so, so the Zen tradition has become a tradition uh, due to their circumstances uh, of collecting all these stories of encounters between master and disciples or master and master. Uh, and in the context of these encounters and exchanges, some fundamental truth is revealed. Yeah? So that's how you should relate to these Zen stories. So one of the stories is, so the, the disciple asked the master, no, the master asked this disciple, do you understand emptiness? Okay, that's when you know, uh-oh. <laughs> uh-oh. So he bit the bait. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the master said, okay, show me. Your understanding. So the disciple goes. Master goes. No. The student was brave enough. Show me emptiness. The master said. <laughs> right? His hand goes out. What does he do? He grabs the disciple's nose <laughs> and pulls him across the room, the meditation hall. And the student is yelling and screaming in pain. The master just pulls him across the meditation hall, got to the other end, and the master goes. <laughs> They always make this dramatic exit, you know, in all these stories. He leaves. So what's going on? Right? It's like this, yeah. Sure. In a way, right? In a way. But that's abstract. It's when this is happening. <laughs> when this is happening, you know? and you get what emptiness is, that's when you really know. Form is emptiness. It's all yada, yada, yada. It, it's all just like, oh yes, emptiness in the abstract. It's when the elephant of suffering somehow, you know, turns up in your living room. You're like, how did it get here? It's when the elephant of suffering turns up. It's when someone is dragging your nose across the room. Huh? And you understand emptiness. That's when you get it. So form is empty. And so because these days, you know, there are lawyers and there are courts and there are protection against violence being committed. So we have seminars like this rather than just pulling each other's noses <laughs> across rooms. Sorry. <laughs> yes, it is tempting. Therefore, 
the protection against uh, the pr protection for the mind against suffering of the perfection of wisdom is the protection of mind of great knowledge is the unsurpassed protection for the mind it is the unequal protection for the mind for the heart it is the protection that completely pacifies all suffering since there is no deception it should be known to be true this protection of the mind of the heart against suffering of the perfection of wisdom is as follows gone 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 beyond gone utterly beyond awake that's how avalokiteshvara ends his instruction to shariputra then the rest of it is the closing Uh, just to point out, in the version of the Heart Sutra that is most commonly used in East Asia, meaning China, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, uh, it doesn't have the opening section and the closing section. It goes immediately, it starts immediately with uh, that section uh, around page 3. At that time, noble Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, beheld the practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and perceived the five skandhas to be empty of intrinsic nature. Uh, the East Asian version starts there. And then the next section, they also don't have. Then by the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputta said to, that also is not there. From, from that section on page three, it goes straight into... Uh, form is empty, emptiness also is form. That's the East Asian version uh, that is chanted, that is used uh, in China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam. Uh, China, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, they all use the same Buddhist canon, which is recorded in classical Chinese. Just as throughout the Himalayan region and in Mongolia, they use the same Buddhist canon, which is recorded in classical Tibetan. But Mongolians learn classical Tibetan, Nepali learn classical Tibetan, Bhutanese learn classical Tibetan, Ladakis learn classical Tibetan, because that's the canonical language for them. So in East Asia, in Vietnam, China, Korea, Japan, they all read classical Chinese. But in the classical Chinese Buddhist canon, uh, this version exists too, with the opening, kind of explaining, setting up the scene, all of that, which is more typical of most sutras, right? to give you the setting, and then to say what happened after the, the sermon or the teaching is given, which is the version used by Tibetans, which is the version that we shared here in this book just FYI otherwise in the Zen tradition for example the sutra ends with the mantra gade gade bara gade parastam gade bodhiswaha that's it and they end there now then um, if we look at this right it says on page uh, 9 Thus, Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in this profound perfection of wisdom. So this is Avalokiteshvara, the Lord of love and compassion, telling Shariputra, the, the most intelligent disciple among the Buddhist historical disciples, and the one who just gets it immediately. Uh, so then going on, it says, then the Bhagavan, then the Buddha arose from that samadhi, and then he... Uh, here, the setting tells us, or the conclusion tells us, he then like certifies, so to say, what Avalokiteshvara said uh, by saying, Excellent, excellent, O son of noble lineage, thus it is, O son of noble family, thus it is. One should practice this profound perfection of wisdom just as you have taught it. Uh, 
Even all the Buddhists rejoice in what you have just said. Then the Bhagavan, having so spoken, Venerable Shariputra, Noble Avalokiteshvara, Bodhisattva Mahasattva, and the whole assembly and the entire world with its gods, humans, demigods, and Gandharvas rejoice and praise the words of the Bhagavan. And then that's the end of the sutra. Then included in this handout is, uh, so if you look at in the small italics, italicized words, it says, if one wishes to put the sutra into practice, so this is a form of sadhana in the Vajrayana tradition. It says, if you want to put this sutra into practice, and obviously here is not talking about putting the knowledge, but rather to, to make this into a formal practice. This is how you do it. It says, in the space before, your, before you, imagine, visualize the Buddha making the demon-taming gesture. Demon-taming gesture is very simple. Simply the hand, and the tips of his right hand touching the earth, yeah, rested on his right knee. Yeah, that's called demon-taming. <laughs> yeah. So this is a reference to when Siddhartha was on the eve, on the very verge of his awakening, of his uh, transformation from a confused state into the state of uh, free from confusion, a perfect Buddha, the demons all came, it says. At first they came uh, to cast doubt uh, in his ability to become awake. And he turned that away. And then they came in the form of temptation. Then he turned them away. Then they came in the form of threat. He turned them away. Uh, but this gesture, this mudra, is called demon taming. So it's referring to that episode in the Buddhist life. So they say you should imagine, think of the Buddha seated like that. Then uh, he is flanked, uh, maybe better word, better translate, less literal, but is, he's flanked by Avalokiteshvara and Shariputra who are conversing with each other. Uh, so to his right is Avalokiteshvara and Shariputra sitting here and they are talking to each other. In other words, you 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 recreate this original uh, scenario. Then you imagine surrounded by the monks, nuns, and the bodhisattvas. And now, rather than something in the past, right, you are in this assembly. You have joined this teaching. You are in there. Then, being mindful of the meaning of emptiness, so remembering whatever you can of this, the teaching in this sutra, recite the profound sutra seven times or more. So recite the sutra. In a way, to recite the sutra, right, is to help you recall, right, all the meanings. And then followed by the recitation of the knowledge mantra as much as possible. And this is Teyata Om Gate Gate Parakate Parasangate Bodhisoha. So seven recitations of the sutra followed by repeating this mantra as many times as you can. In how it is practiced today, People don't take it so literally, seven times, sometimes in a rush, in a hurry, one time, sometimes three times. And then, and there you let the mind settle on the meaning of this emptiness. Then 
Then it says, afterwards perform the turning back of deeds <laughs> with the following words. And then you go on to reciting. Namo homage to the Guru, homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha, homage to the Great Mother, perfection of wisdom. May my true words be accomplished. What are these true words? This is like, may these words of truth, you could also translate it that way. And now it, it, it references another episode in the life of the Buddhas, where it is said that at one point, the king of the gods, uh, Indra, the Lord of the Gods on page 14, was, was having a struggle with the demigods, the demons. And the demons were about to take over in the world. And Indra and his gods, the, the beings of light, which is what devas mean, beings of light, these light beings were losing uh, this fight. So, the, so Indra, the king of the gods, came to the Buddha and asked for help. And the Buddha says, you can repel these demons eh, by meditating on the profound meaning of the perfection of wisdom. And it said that in doing that, you know, Indra eh, and his light beings became triumphant over darkness. So symbolic here. How it is used today is that, you know, people would eh, do this practice. And so here you, you clap. By reciting, by reciting these words, reverse all maras, clap. May they be destroyed, clap. May they be pacified, clap. Three times. Then the fourth one, uh, no clap. May they be totally pacified. No clap because yeah, it's totally pacified now. The clap is to show, you know, actually, that's all it takes, you know. To turn away darkness. I'm like, that's really easy. Yes, actually, it is. I mean, the really the real question here is: do we are we serious about turning back darkness? I think, like, no, can I keep some of it? It's kind of fun. <laughs> then <laughs> won't go away, you know. So the, so the resolve, if the resolve is there and the understanding is there, then all darkness, all suffering can be turned away. It's not saying stopping people from coming to harass you, you know. It's saying you are not there for them to be harassed. So back to that question of how does Lord Yama not find you? You know, how does the king of death not find you? It's not like he's not going to come. It's just you're not available. <laughs> huh? Or the illusion of the intrinsic self has been removed. So when Ma... When, yeah. Yama can only try looking for that person. The illusory self. And when you remove that, then... He, he can't find you. But if you don't remove it thoroughly, he can still get your right ear. <laughs> There's a play there in that story because that's have I heard. There's some, you know, kind of like a little um, kind of comic relief there. Yeah, in that telling of that story. It's intentional, I think, the right ear. That's if I heard. <laughs> There's nothing to hear. That layers and layers of symbolism going on in these stories. Then... After this, may they be totally pacified. Then you recite this. Whatever is arisen, this is a final teaching. This is said to summarize uh, the core import of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, all 18 titles. Uh, teach what? Teach this. 
whatever is arisen dependent on conditions, which is basically everything except for space. Space doesn't arise based on conditions. And the state of Buddha itself. To get to Buddhahood, of course, causes and conditions is necessary. But the state of Buddhahood is without, it's not conditioned. So, but everything else, so meaning everything else that has arisen due to conditions, in fact, their nature is without cessation, without arising, without annihilation, without permanence, without coming, without going without distinctions, without identity. No different, they are not different, and they are not the same. These are the eight negations. Neither born nor destroyed. Neither coming nor going. Neither permanent nor nihilistic, basically. Neither eternal nor Eternal, not eternalism, not nihilism, without coming, without going, without distinction, not different, not same. And then peaceful, more literally quiescent, quiet. The great silence, free from fabrications. The great silence is not the silencing of sound. The great silence is that silence that exists in the midst of noise and sounds. Free from fabrication. No more fabricating. No more fabricating. Homage to the sublime words of the perfect Buddhists. So this is a small kind of formal practice that you can do to continue your kind of practice of this heart sutra. Question about the sadness. Mm -hmm. Practice this, do you visualize yourself as the Buddha surrounding? No, in this case, you are in the audience when this teaching was given, just that, according to this. Yeah, there's no particular prescription that you should visualize yourself as this or that. And more typical of sadness is you 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 imagine, you think, you visualize, you know, all, all those words can, can be used depending on how familiar you are with that image, you think of yourself as a Buddha figure, not in this case. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> got it, got it, gone, gone. <laughs> yes. What is it? Huh? What is it? Yeah, why is emptiness? Right. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> First, sign the release form. <laughs> Actually, I think the law doesn't allow you to sign away <laughs> your right not to be abused. <laughs> well, I have another question. Yes. In the story you told about the Zen, no, what's the end of the story? It, it, did he become enlightened? Which one? Ah, oh, so the question of what is the end of the story of the pulling of the nose? With a lot of these stories, there's no end. It's just the abrupt, the master exit stage, you know? <laughs> yeah. 
most of these stories have don't really tell you what happens afterwards, you know. That's why, that's why my reason of, you know, don't take this as literally what happened, but take this as a teaching device, you know. These are all pedagogical tools. Likewise, like there's a story in the Zen tradition about how in order to receive this teaching from Bodhidharma, right, the first kind of person who brought this tradition to, to the East, and the, his successor had to lop off his hand and offer it to the teacher, you know. There's this theme of cutting off hands, it seems, you know. And it's like, what? No, like, I mean, if you really think about it, right, you're like, why? Like, there are other dramatic things you could do. Like, what is the meaning of, like, lopping off your hand to get his attention, you know? <laughs> it turns out, so, again, scholars have looked into it, has found old references to how Huike, which is the name of this guy, actually lost his hand in a robbery. Yeah, so so there was a disciple of Bodhidharma without a hand, but later it became the stuff of legends <laughs> to illustrate some point, you know. So they are loosey goosey with you know <laughs> what is. So you cannot take the, I think these stories. Yeah. Like news, you know, like you can't take news as news these days. But maybe he felt like it took the, the robbery and the cutting off of his arm to bring him to the right group. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's what I mean. You can interpret it, you know, you can read it on so many levels. The people who made up the stories were making it up, you know, like link, making links that it's, it's not like just what happened. I mean, at the end of the day, in fact, when you come to that issue, you can say, is there ever, it just happened. No, there's always so many other tellings. The uh, enumerations, uh -huh. everything is no this, no, no, no. No, enumerations is not the no, no part. It's the listing out part. What is the no, what is the negation of everything? What is that part? That's the Mahayana. Okay. So uh, so then is, is the assumption that you're supposed to uh, embrace loss? No, it's not so much about embracing loss. So the question is like the no, 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 is it about embracing loss? No, it's not. Because it's not doing away with it. It's saying, when you look deeper, you can see a more subtle point there. That yes, uh, there are the five skandhas. But even the five skandhas are not inherently existing categories of things. Uh, they are devices to illuminate uh, something deeper. Yes. Is there a point of like no more learning, no meditation, um, no practice, no? Dharma, well, no. Dharma. Yeah. Is there a point of no more learning? Well, mm, for those who like to see the light at the end of tunnel, yes. <laughs> Not in this. <laughs> Not in this lifetime, if you are wedded to the light at the end of the tunnel. If you have this power to wield the Vajrayana, then there's no end. And no end is good news. That's the thing. There is no end and no end is good news. Rather than no end is exhausting. You know? Mm -hmm. So, so to say, at the Mahayana level, 
it can go wrong when you see no end as hopeless. That is the fear that arises for bodhisattvas, for, let's say, uh, not so mature bodhisattvas. The fear. But if fear arises for you as bodhisattva, you know, meaning you have taken the vow, don't think, oh, it's wrong. It's not. It's just part of the process. Fear arising is not like, oh, you've done it wrong. It's just part of the process. So related to your question about fear, it's part of the process. What you need to do when you see that fear arising is then to come to these teachings as in to remember this teaching here. I'll say is that you can cultivate this fearlessness. By again, you know, there is productive fearlessness, then there is foolish fearlessness. <laughs> Attack! Unprepared, then food for the lions. <laughs> Don't try to slay the dragon unprepared. And holding a bottle of ketchup doesn't help. <laughs> then you will not only be crunchy, but also tasty. So we will stop here today so that you all have a little bit of Sunday left so that your pets and your family can have a little bit of you and you can practice the professional wisdom <laughs> in the midst of pets and family. And <laughs> huh? Oh, yeah, right. Not with the cats. Um, so anyway, uh, the next retreat program we have is more practice oriented in that sense. It's for those people who received that lion face Dakini empowerment when His Holiness was here. Or if under other circumstances you have received that empowerment and you want to do the practice, that is at the end of this month on a Saturday, Sunday, but Sunday is only the first uh, part of uh, morning until noon and then we end. So that's more a practice retreat. Of course, I will explain a little, which actually I already did uh, during the empowerment at the, the afternoon of that empowerment about a few weeks ago. Uh, but we're going to go over those instructions so that you uh, refresh and get familiar with uh, this deity yoga practice. And so come if you can, if you uh, have the empowerment. Um, in April, we will have, I'm scheduling some programs as well. Uh, so stay tuned if you are interested. Otherwise, you know, every uh, Thursday, uh, we meet here in Open Sangha. That's always a good time to connect and check in with each other. Uh, then there is a more kind of commitment expected <laughs> gathering that happens on Wednesday nights. These are people who are practicing in the Drigong Gagyu tradition. Obviously, when you start, you have no idea what that means, if that's what you're looking for. Uh, and for that, we say, you know, come on the first Wednesday of the month. And then from there, come again until you see, is it really for you? But you won't know unless you come a few times consecutively. Otherwise, it's just, <laughs> you know. Uh, but Thursday is a good time. Then Sunday morning, we do an offering of uh, smoke cleansing. 
at 10 every Sunday morning. Unless we have a program like this, then that's not happening. Um, so that's the basic kind of related to this set of teachings. That many other things happen at Urban Dharma. We have a handout there that shows you what happens in the whole week. And there's the refuge, taking a refuge that we mentioned yesterday, a reminder that happens on Wednesday, the 20th, 7 p.m. for those who want to take refuge and have a haircut. <laughs> Uh, bring your own haircut bib. Is that what they call it? I don't know what they call that thing. <laughs> haircut bib. <laughs> so we end again uh, with a dedication. 142. Page 142. At the bottom of 142, by this merit may I achieve the omniscient state. May all who wander on the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. Cross the ocean of samsara by defeating all enemies, confusion, bodhicitta, the excellent and precious mind. Where it is unborn, may it arise. Where it is born, may it not decline. Ever increase higher and higher. Sanju Sam Chorin Poche Marke Barna Gayuchi Gayam Palme Palviha Hone if you can help us to put things away, that will be incredibly helpful. Push things away, chairs away, texts away. Then nobody has to stay back for too long. Thank you so much. Ta, again, you know where we are, and bye-bye all of you out there.